Welcome to the Probate Nation. I am Richard Ruddy. As loved ones age, they often need someone to manage their finances, and typically this is handled by a family member. Absent a durable financial power of attorney, however, a court-appointed conservator may be necessary at some point to have someone formally assume, assume all those responsibilities. In our show tonight, we will dive into the responsibilities of a court-appointed conservator, including handling all financial assets and income, paying bills, filing tax returns, and much more. We are pleased to have back as our guest tonight two attorneys who, are, who often serve as conservators, and they will offer practical advice based on their experiences, highlight common challenges they've faced, and provide you with some tools you may need to care for the finances of your loved one with confidence. Let me turn and introduce you to our guest. Our first guest is attorney Kia Condori, who is a partner in the Fairfax law firm of Condori and Morad. His practice focuses on guardianships, conservatorships, guardian ad litem matters, and estate and probate cases. He serves as a guardian and conservator for individuals across Virginia and assists family with the best care possible for their loved ones. Our second guest is attorney Joshua Bushman with the Bushman Law Group in Alexandria, Virginia. He maintains a general law practice with a focus on fiduciary matters, including serving as a guardian and conservator for incapacitated adults. He is the founder of the League of Guardians, a nonprofit that assists socially and economically disadvantaged incapacitated adults residing in Virginia long-term care facilities. Please welcome attorneys Kia Condori and Josh Bushman. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Uh, Josh, I'm going to go to you right away because we need to kind of, kind of tee this up. Tell me a little bit briefly about uh, how someone gets appointed as conservator in Virginia. Thank you. The legal process starts by the filing of a petition for the appointment of a conservator. Prior to the filing of the petition for a conservator, I, when I'm representing the petitioner, I'm asking my clients to talk to medical providers as a medical evaluation will be need to be filed in support that an incapacitated adult is incapacitated and needs the protection of a conservator. The second thing that needs to go in the petition is identification of who the conservator will be. And part of that process, I'm also asking the client to check with the conservator uh, to make sure that they could get bonded for what they believe are the assets that will be under the conservatorship. Once the petition is filed, the court appoints a guardian litem who will do an investigation, file a report with the court, which will come to a hearing. And at that hearing, if the court finds that the individual is incapacitated and needs the protection of a conservator, they will appoint a conservator. After the court enters in the order, the order is taken to the probate office where the conservator can qualify in that position as a conservator. That's, thank you for that very, very uh, good overview of it. I want our viewers to know that we have done a number of shows over the last year or two um, involving the application for a guardianship or conservatorship uh, in each of the Northern Virginia jurisdictions, and you're welcome to watch those. They are, happen to be on the Probate Nation YouTube channel. You know, Key, I'm going to turn to you now to begin a discussion about the uh, and getting an overview of the responsibilities of a conservator. Tell me a little bit about... Um, you know, someone's been duly appointed and qualified as an adult person. What what kind of responsibilities that does that conservator have? Sure. And when do Above all, sure. And when do those actually begin? Uh, it's a great a great uh, question. There, you know, the duty of the conservator. You know, it is strictly related to financial accounts, assets, property, um, and the the primary duty is just to protect all of the assets for your incapacitated adult. That may be in the form of tangible personal property, that may be in the form of accounts, maybe real property, but a conservator's job is to really just protect the assets uh, and then obviously corral all of the assets to the best way possible. Um, and, and those duties start right from the beginning. Uh, they may start even a little bit before uh, in these uncontested matters where you need to be able to understand and put yourself in the shoes of your incapacitated adult to see how they were living their life and in what accounts and, and how um, their expenditures were going and what they were spending money on, were there things that were being automated. But overall, uh, a conservator is there to take care of the finances and financial obligations. 
Now, I think it's important for our viewers to know, Josh mentioned that he described the process to, to, to petition the court. There is going to be a bond. That bond's going to be backed up by an insurance company. So if you don't do your job right, the insurance company will step in and make things whole, and then they're going to come after you. So you want to make sure you take, things, take care of things correctly from the very get-go. Uh, I'm going to turn down, down and talk back with uh, Josh about start to get into some uh, the detailed list of conservator responsibility. So, Josh, I've been appointed. Um, should I be worried about forwarding the mail, or should I just go around and pick up the mail at the look at the at the ward's uh, uh, house from time to time? Great question, and I think the uh, the spirit behind that question is I want to make sure I don't miss an asset or an income source. And if your individual that uh, you're serving for is incapacity, can't tell you what their income sources are or assets, or they're not able to be credible in the information they give you, one of the best ways to cooperate it or to find additional sources of income and assets or debts, as the case may be, is to forward the mail. And you can forward the mail either by going to the post office or you could do it online. When I forward the mail, I usually forward the mail to my office address. Uh, that way I can sort it and get any other per personal mail we can then deliver to the incapacitated adult wherever they may be residing. So, Jeff, let me stay with you here. Now, let's talk a little bit about bank accounts, okay? So, the person has a bunch of personal bank accounts. What do we do with those? With the personal bank accounts, I always try to go and make a visit to the financial institution uh, I want to get copies of statements. If I know this is going to be a Medicaid case, I'm trying to go back years' worth of statements. I'm going to analyze the behavior that's going in the accounts. But ultimately, I'm looking to close out the account, have to make a check payable to the conservatorship. And then do you, do you set up a separate bank account for the conservatorship? And then how would that should be titled? Oh, absolutely. I think it's one of the statutory requirements is that uh, you set up a conservatorship account and you could then deposit those other cashier's checks you've received from the closed out personal accounts. When we title the conservatorship account, it's one of two ways. It's either going to be your name, the conservator for the incapacitated adult, or it's going to be the opposite, the incapacitated adult by your name as conservator. Now, the bank I go to set up that account with, is there anything special I should be able to, I should ask them to make sure I get uh, monthly uh, in order to make sure I can fulfill my obligations in, in my reporting responsibilities? Certainly. When we're operating as a conservator, chances are you have oversight by the circuit court in the form of somebody called the Commissioner of Accounts who's going to be reviewing your filings that you file with the court. It starts with an inventory and then an accounting. It's one part of the accountings. There's something uh, that you're going to need to provide for every disbursement or distribution, which is a receipt. One of the easiest ways to provide a receipt is if you got a copy of a canceled check or the copy of the uh, image of a canceled check, the front and the back. And so that's one of the things I definitely request when I set up a bank account. And I think it's important to make sure people know you need, sometimes you need to request that because they may not automatically give that to you. Um, now, should I should uh, the new conservator order checks in the name of the conservatorship so they can pay bills? I believe so, and that's something I would recommend to all my you know, clients that serve as a conservator, and certainly what I do as a conservator is uh, we operate on a check basis. We don't operate by paying things on a credit card. We don't operate by paying things on debit cards, uh, and that all goes back to what is the commissioner of accounts uh, uh, wanting to see in terms of the acts. Uh, uh, performed by the conservator, and it, it, the tried and true method is you pay by a check. That way, the endorsement of the check also constitutes a receipt if it's you know signed by a ledger party. Key, I'm going to come to you now. We we talked about bank accounts. Okay, so many people have brokerage accounts, both the uh, non qual non retirement and retirement accounts. What should be done with those accounts? Yeah, this is where, uh, as a conservator, you really want to get to know your financial advisors. If there's account managers, um, the the best practice is obviously your record keeping, keeping things separate, keeping things clean. It is not uh, necessarily 
uh, a conservator just taking a scorched earth approach to just liquidate everything. You know, there's certain tax obligations that come through in terms of a brokerage account. Uh, your incapacitated adult may have had positions in stocks and other accounts for many, many, many years. And if you just blanketly and blindly go ahead to sell stocks and sell assets, there could be unintended tax consequences and positions that you may lose. So naturally, you want to hopefully be able to position yourself in a way where your conservatorship account, um, as Josh alluded to, properly titled, properly maintained, and that you have enough there um, uh, to continue on the the day-to-day -day or a reasonable month uh, kind of future forecasting. And then if there are other stock accounts, brokerage accounts, you maintain that separately, also in the name uh, of entitled properly in the name of the conservatorship. Okay, Key, I'm gonna keep on with our discussion about uh, brokerage accounts. So we have the non-retirement brokerage accounts. Should those be put in the name of the conservatorship? Yes, you want to take all accounts uh, and at the very minimum, provide your court order, provide your certificate of qualification to ensure that everything is properly titled and in your control as a conservator. And, but retirement accounts, we don't we don't change the, t the title of that because we don't want to create a tax consequence. That, that's correct. Okay. So, Josh, I'm going to come to you now and let's talk a little bit about pensions and other direct deposits. You know, who should be contacted to to change the direct deposit checks for Social Security, for instance? Great question you're going to have to contact the Social Security Administration. And you've got one of two ways of doing it. One, you show up over at your local Social Security office. Or number two, you call and make an appointment to show up at your local Social Security office. Okay. When you show up there, you're going to have to file a rep payee application, and they will process you as a rep payee. Okay. And then let's talk a little. I'm just trying to touch on some of the common things. If someone's getting an OPM pension, who do we have to contact to make that change? Once again, that's the Office of Personnel Management, similar to Social Security Administration. However, it's in Boyerstown or Boyers, Pennsylvania. Uh, you will make contact through them, not by showing up anywhere, but by <laughs> drafting a letter and by filing a representative payee application. It's important to note that OPM, Social Security Administration, don't need to appoint you. They don't have to appoint you. Uh, they will consider your order and the suggestion that maybe the court has made that you should serve in the role as a representative payee. And most often, they go with that suggestion that is uh, ordered in the local court order. Okay, so I've, and, and that's important because they, 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 they have their own set of rules. So if I have a military pension, then uh, who do I contact to get that redirected now to the conservatorship account? If it's a military pension, it's going to fall into two sources. Uh, first is DFAS, Department of uh, Financial Accounting Services, and the second is going to be the Department of Veteran Affairs. If the individual has been rated uh, with a disability, part of their military retirement is actually going to be paid by the VA, and that portion of it's going to be tax-free, whereas everything that comes from DFAS is uh, taxable and uh, under technically a se separate entity. Now, if I have a retirement account and I'm already in the, well, I'm already supposed to be taking out the annual minimum required distributions, what do I do about those, uh, those, those distributions? Going back to a little bit about what Kia said, I mean, you, you really want to make sure that those financial institutions have your information, have the conservatorship checking account, so that when they make the RMDs, they can be distributed into that account. I would also consult a financial advisor to determine what is the taxable uh, effect of how this occurs, plus try to look at my budget as a conservator to say, do I need to take this all in January? Can I wait to take it longer so they can maybe have more time to grow? Or does my budget uh, require a monthly distribution uh, because it's going to come as part of a monthly income that we need in order to meet our monthly obligations? Okay, Kia, yeah, I'm gonna. This is something I, I, I've become very enamored with is is unclaimed property. So a lot of times people don't you know get their refund for their deposit as whatever it might be. But there's different jurisdictions, and Virginia is not is just like it. They have an office that actually, you know, will have a record of unclaimed property that might be due might be due someone. Um, do you normally suggest people check that when they first take over as conservator? 
Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the Virginia Department of Treasury, you can go to trs.virginia.gov. You can go right online uh, and search in the name of your incapacitated adult. Um, you may want to try uh, if they have other former names or previous names to just double check and triple check. A lot of times you're also able to call uh, and speak to a representative and provide a social in case it's a very common name uh, for your um, incapacitated adult and you're not sure if it is the right person. Um, but certainly, Virginia, you'd be surprised how many hundreds uh, and thousands of dollars are just down there in Richmond waiting to be claimed. Uh, and these are vital amount of funds that could be there for uh, the person that you're serving as a conservator for to be used for their care, used um, to pay off debts, bills, uh, and other items that, you know, one, two, five, ten years may just have been sitting down there for a really long time. It's very, it's very true. Uh, I know that uh, and I'm going to kind of we're, we're I'm looking at my time frame on the my my people are waving at me again. Um, but uh, certainly if you decide to pay bills as a conservator, I know we want to make sure that we use checks. We have invoices so we can document everything. Um, and then, of course, at some point, then it's going to be important to uh, assess a budget to make sure we understand, you know, what we have in the way of ongoing expenses, what we have in the way of income. So we see whether we have we need to do any planning there. Josh, I want to go to you, though, and talk a little bit just real quickly about tax filings, because one of the things you take over as conservator, you're now responsible for, for filing tax returns. Okay, so we're going to go up a little bit further here, further along in our show. And tell me a little bit about, um, you know, the types of uh, who need, who's going to sign the tax return now that somebody is, um, is uh, it, the conservator has been appointed, who's going to be signing the tax return for the ward? The conservator is going to file the tax return, and the returns are going to file are income taxes, both federally and at the local level, state level. Okay, and of course, there, there's 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 a need. To, sometimes you can't have you don't have enough information. You know, you don't have that stuff, so you may have to go. Do you have to notify the IRS that you're in charge by filing any special forms in order to let them know that they can talk to you? I'd always recommend hiring a tax professional, but in short, most tax professionals are going to have you sign a Form 56, which is a fiduciary uh, reporting filing. Okay. Uh, Key, I'm going to turn to you now, though. Again, I want to make sure we cover all of these things. Um, talk about um, reporting requirements that a conservator has. Uh, the Commissioner of Accounts oversees everything that goes on in this conservatorship. Tell me ab about a little bit about what is the first document we're going to have to file as a conservator after appointment. Absolutely, absolutely. Within the first uh, four months, you're going to have to do an inventory for the incapacitated adult. You know, this is a document that kind of lays the foundations for what are the assets. Now, naturally, um, there may be, depending on your incapacitated adult, other statements, other assets that get discovered later on. You may be able to do an amended inventory but from the get-go, you want to make sure that any financial institution has your court order and your um, certificate of qualification to be able to get statements from the date that you qualify. That's going to be the starting date of your reporting requirement. And one of the keys is your inventory really sets up how you do your first accounting and the accountings thereafter. Um, so you don't want to start behind the eight ball and not do your inventory properly in, in terms of listing accounts, listing vehicles, listing property, um, periodic income that comes in, real property that an incapacitated adult may own. With the inventory, there are no actual bank statements or any other statements that are required that'll come later on for your accounting. But this is all due to the commissioner of accounts, as well as the appropriate filing fees that are made payable to the commissioner of accounts. Yes, and then after that, I think you mentioned there is an accounting that has to be done, and that's going to be done then periodically thereafter. Uh, that is where you where the rubber hits the road. Okay, at that point in time, everything you do, every dollar in, every dollar out, is going to have to be be, be documented. As the uh, former uh, legendary commissioner of accounts, Jack Rush, used to say, you know, we we always trust, but we like to verify. Okay, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go quickly because I want to make sure we don't run out of time. Uh, Josh, first week of appointment, uh, after appointment, what's the one thing you would suggest someone has to do? Uh, one thing is uh, open a checking account for the conservatorship. Key, a second week, the, the, the first month, what's the one thing that uh, a conservator needs to get done uh, one month afterwards? One month afterwards, you just want to make sure you have some proper footing on income. 
Where is the income going? Do you have access to it? If you don't, how can you? Um, because things start happening really quickly as far as third parties wanting payment, needing payment, bills and things stacking up. And Josh, 90 days after the appointment, what are the things we really want to be focused on at that point? Making sure that all the tasks that occurred during the first 90 days are being accomplished and the case is processing forward with your care plan and coordination with the guardian. Okay. Now, again, much much like the guardian, the conservator um, gets to charge fees. Kia, tell me a little bit about what fees a, a conservator can charge, who establishes those fees, and who approves those fees. Keep in mind, we're, right. we're, keep in mind, we're we're running a little bit short on time. <laughs> no problem at all. I'll I'll put it in a nutshell for you. Your court order hopefully has some sort of language allowing for reasonable compensation. 64.2 is your golden source for reasonable compensation that a conservator can charge. Those may be based on the total assets at the beginning of your accounting period, um, but then there is also a separate allowable percentage amount based on the um, non-period uh, in income that comes in per month. Um, just make an annotation there that on other items such as veterans uh, benefits, the percentage is a little bit different. Um, but your commissioner of accounts is your gatekeeper. So if something goes wrong or some compensation is done or is not done right, or you're curious on that, reach out to your commissioner as they're going to be the ones that are going to approve any compensation that you take for your incapacitated adult. Very good answer. I would I would alert folks that when they hire counsel, that make sure the counsel is actually dis, d, 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 discriminating. I, w, if they do work for you, that actually is something that you should do. Then you might find that your fee gets dinged a little bit. And if they're doing legal work, they need to carefully document that so that it's actually concealed that that's legal work, which would not affect your fee. Um, so I wanted to get, and I didn't mean to rush you guys, but I wanted to really get, have you guys share some of the common problems and pitfalls you've experienced. So, Key, I'm going to stay with you first. What are some of the common problems that you've observed and encountered as a conservator over the years? Uh, yeah, one of the common problems is getting financial in financial institutions to understand the role of the conservator and actually understand how things need to be titled, how reporting re requirements work, what we need from financial institutions. And really, you have to set the tone early on to let them know, hey, I'm court supervised. I have a commissioner of accounts that's reviewing everything. It's not some, you know, just regular checking account where um, things can just kind of happen on the fly. Um, so you want to make sure that financial institutions, financial advisors, everybody is aware that you are the conservator and the legal requirements. A lot of times they confuse this with an agent under a power of attorney, and they are not the same thing. Good point. Josh, how about yourself? How, what are some of the common problems and pitfalls you've encountered as a conservator over the years? Certainly. I, I want to mirror what Kia has said, and I will call that kind of upstream dealing with uh, financial institutions, I'm gonna say going downstream, dealing with third parties, uh, disbursements, distributions, having them understand that you are overseen by a commissioner of accounts and that you just can't unilaterally do something because they want you to do so. <laughs> that you have this thing called a fiduciary duty, you need to discharge it, and that it's gonna happen within the confines of the commissioner of accounts and the court system, looking at uh, what you are doing to make sure that you can properly account for it when that time comes. Uh, very, both those are very good points, Josh. I'm going to stay with you though. Give me some give me some closing comments. You know, about um, you know pitfalls and suggestions and guidance you would want to share for someone who's going to become a conservator in the coming months. I guess number one is going to be don't get pushed around from people that don't have a fiduciary duty. They want you to act. They want you to do something. You got to put a pause. You got to step back and say, is this what's best for the ward? Is this what uh, is good for uh, discharge of the fiduciary duty that you have to the incapacitated adult? And don't feel the need to necessarily rush into a decision without thinking through the decision uh, from the standpoint of a conservator and, if need be, consult an attorney. Key, how about yourself? Final thoughts, suggestions, words of advice? Record keeping and organization is everything. As long as you aren't commingling assets and you have all of your accounts and records, invoices, receipts all intact, don't sweat. You have everything at your arsenal and disposal to show why a disbursement was made, where a payment came in and out. And at the end of the day, it's all about record keeping. Very true. And guys, I want to thank you on behalf of the Probate Nation for 
for taking the time to share your expertise on the duties and responsibilities of a court-appointed conservator, and for providing some really practical insights on the important steps to be taken during that first 90 days after appointment. You know, valuable information, a great public service to all the members of the probate nation across Virginia. Uh, serving as a conservator for an incapacitated adult is no small undertaking. Thank you for your service. But as, but as our guests outlined over the course of the show, there are many tasks to do during the first 90 days. Some are obvious, others are not. All of these tasks involve great risks which you can be held personally responsible for. So I would be remiss if I did not encourage strongly that you consult with an experienced attorney about the, your conservatorship. It will be time well spent and allow you to drive this living probate train called a conservatorship without mishap or accidents in the years that lie ahead. This concludes our show this evening. We hope you found it informative. Just a reminder that replays of this show can be viewed on the Probate Nation YouTube channel. And if you want to receive guardian, conservatorship, and probate tips, please join the Probate Nation by signing up for the free monthly newsletter. Until next time, I'm Richard Ruddy, and this is the Probate Nation.